Welcome to our discussion and exploration of one of the most interesting aspects of humanity out there, the brain. One of your first reactions to this might be, why does this feel like an anatomy class? Unfortunately, the brain is quite complicated and we are actually taking a somewhat simplistic explanation. There are just a lot of important areas that we're gonna to have to know to be able to then apply in explaining later on the thoughts and actions of the people around us and ourselves. A general theme would be if we're dealing with a certain type of thought or behavior, how localized in the brain is it? How much brain real estate is devoted to performing that particular thought or action? But first, true, false. This is actually true. We find out that some people can read just fine, but then if you ask them to go write that exact sentence, they can't perform the motor task. You can also find the, the opposite of that. Some people can write, but they are unable to actually read, which means they can copy what they see, but they don't understand what they see. This is false. It is a little tricky though, because creativity does tend to be processed more in one hemisphere, but as we'll find out, that hemisphere is the right hemisphere. This is certainly true. Uh, and in some ways, when our dopamine reward system gets out of whack, our behavior tends to mimic that more of lower animals compared to humans, higher order of thinking, moral judgment, decision-making humans. This is one of those that's so weird, it has to be true. As we'll find out, there are some problems with this, and there are only certain times in the lifespan where this would even be possible. But there are actual case studies where this was done, and we'll find out why. If anybody has had brain freeze, it might feel like there is tons of pain in our brain. The problem is that this is false. Uh, it turns out that the head freeze or brain freeze is a result of uh, constriction of blood vessels in the roof of our mouth and not actually in our brain. Our brain does not have pain receptors, so oftentimes there can be major damage to our brain due to tumors or head injuries that we're not even aware the damage is taking place because we don't feel acute pain. This is another common myth that I think progress is being made toward debunking. Once again, head injury can easily happen and in some kinds be undetected, not only by the people who are observing, but also by the person, him or herself. Seeing stars, is an indication that something traumatic has happened, but that's not the only uh, indicator that something serious has happened. Going back to more myths about neuroscience, amazingly, college-educated Brazilians, I don't know if this sample was much different from average college-educated Americans, but they believed in the we only use 10% of our brain myth. And here's the part that's truly astounding for me, is that of neuroscientists in this Brazilian sample, 6% believed in the using only 10% of our brain. As we're gonna find out, our brain real estate is extremely valuable and it develops in very predictable patterns for good reasons. And so there's none of it that's wasted. Our key concept today is called prosopagnosia. You may know the more common term for this called face blindness. So, for example, someone with prosopagnosia, which image seems more disturbing to you? Neither, they would say they're about the same. I see two upside down men. A few things are different, um, but not, nothing looks wrong. Um, because when we see a face, normally we see the person, we associate all the things we know about the person. Um, we read so much value from a face. With someone who has prosopagnosia, they can describe it, but they don't get that greater meaning. They don't associate who that person is. Now they can get that association by hearing the person talk, then they can recognize. Um, 
This is commonly uh, observed in the case study of Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Of course, his wife was very angry, thinking that he just was forgetful and not paying attention, when really he had a serious brain disorder. Also, we have these two British twins uh, that were born with it. Most of the time, prosopagnosia forms sometime in adulthood, but it can form at birth. And you see, if you read some of these uh, stories, what it might be like to go through life not being able to see someone's face and know who they are. What's really interesting is that Oliver Sacks, he has passed away now, but later in his life was actually diagnosed with prosopagnosia. And this is one of those disorders that the more we learn about, the more we learn about how to diagnose it, we actually find out that it's much more common. So new estimates now suggest that maybe one person out of 50 has a mild or more case of prosopagnosia. We probably met some of them in our lives and neither of us, the person who has it or us, would be able to tell the difference. Also, just to lighten things up a little bit, we know that a lot of judgments about us are made on our physical attractiveness, but also by our intelligence. And so we'll explore how that's represented physically in our brains. Before we break down individual sections of the brain, let's also consider how do we learn about not only the brain structures, but also how the brain works, in some cases in real time. So we're going to talk about some basic brain measuring and imaging techniques. First, we have the electroencephalograph, which is the EEG. The readout that you see isn't an actual picture of a brain, but instead lines corresponding to activity in specific areas of the brain. And how they measure this is these funny hats with the wires. Sometimes if someone is suspected to have a brain injury, they'll be asked to wear that for a day or two and then come back and have the results interpreted. But this is where we're actually looking at brain waves. Next would be a CAT or a CT scan. It's looking at x-rays. This gives us, out of all these options, the most detailed readout. Uh, oftentimes, if we're looking for uh, a structure such as a tumor, we might want to use a CT scan. Next, we have what's known as a PET scan. What that is using is glucose consumption measurement. You have a tracer uh, that, when later contrasted, lights up, and you can see when you are in here doing certain tasks, what areas of the brain were using the most energy, burning the most glucose. Were they the ones that should be, or were they ones that should not be active for that task? And then perhaps the most helpful, or at least most interesting for research purposes, is the MRI, and specifically the functional fMRI. And this is where, again, somebody is laying down, asked to do a task, such as counting or telling a story, uh, but in real time, we see these sort of creepy 3D images of their head, and we can see while they're talking what areas of the brain light up and switch around. First, we're going to start breaking down the brain from the inside. We're going to start from the oldest evolutionary structures found in the brainstem and work our way out to the more higher order, newer evolutionary structures culminating with the cortex. The brainstem is the oldest part of the brain. Again, in an evolutionary sense, it's the part of the brain that we have the most similarities with almost all other mammals and most other mammals, in fact. It contains our automatic primal survival functions, heavily influencing the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. First, at the very base, we're moving up from the spinal cord and we see this little bump that represents the medulla. This is the basic for heartbeat and breathing. If this is severely damaged, uh, a body will have trouble with these basic functions and their lives will be severely challenged. Fortunately, it is pretty well protected, and so you don't see too many medulla brain injuries, although they do happen. Moving further up, we have the thalamus. This is at the very top 
uh, it is called the sensory switchboard. So this is what we call a bottleneck, meaning that basically all sensory information has to come through the thalamus. The thalamus doesn't do the interpreting, but it does have strong connections or projections to the other parts of the brain that are important to interpret that information. Not shown in the picture, but directly behind this brainstem is what's known as the cerebellum. Uh, this is heavily related to muscle coordination, basic balance, sort of our automatic muscle movement that's well learned. It's also affected by alcohol, so it's not surprising that we slur and that we stumble when we're impaired by alcohol because it's effect on the cerebellum. And finally, we have this middle structure known as the pons. This is also linked to basic attention, sleep regulation. Uh, also, you'll see this is important for dreams. Basically, this acts as a shutoff. When we're dreaming, our brain thinks that it's controlling our bodies to run away from the monster, but that information is not actually going out past the pons to our motor neurons. So when we're dreaming, we're not actually moving our muscles. It also has what's known as the retic reticular formation. This is a structure that uh, a lot of research has been done with cats. If you stimulate that specific area, the cat startles extremely. And of course, if you sever or severely damage that area, the reticular formation, it actually causes the cat to go into a coma that it probably will not wake up from. So again, very basic but important structures for uh, continuing our lives. What's also important is not just learning the different parts of the brain, but looking at how they're connected to or relating to each other. So for example, even though this squishy outer gray matter cortex looks like it's covering the brainstem and the cerebellum, it's not having projections or direct communication to all these areas that it might be touching. Those pathways have to be developed and are only actually there in some cases. So part of mapping the brain is trying to understand, for example, that the thalamus will send visual information back here and it will send sensory information such as touch and heat and cold here, for example, and auditory or sound information here. So the thalamus is going to have a lot of these projections uh, that relate to other areas of the brain. Building out from the top of the brainstem is the limbic system. This is often called the emotional center of the brain, but I want to be clear that this isn't all the emotions that we experience. These are just our basic primal emotions, typically fear and aggression. So higher order emotions such as pride or disgust would have nothing to do with the limbic system. The specific structure is the amygdala and notice it is bilateral so there is one on both the left and right side sort of wrapped around the thalamus here and once again if you stimulate the amygdala you're going to see intense primal fear and aggression. Just below the thalamus we have what makes sense to be called this the hypothalamus this is a small structure, but it is hugely important for a lot of things that we deal with on a daily basis, uh, maintaining body temperature, um, whether we're thirsty or not, hungry or not. And also, it is directly related con and connected to the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is hugely important for proper endocrine system functioning. And finally, the last major structure of the limbic system is the hippocampus. It is less of a visible structure than the others that we've talked about. It's sort of, uh, once it develops a sausage-like structure and it wraps around the back of the thalamus. And note its position here, it's also gonna have lots of projections to the memory storage areas that are sort of on above either of our ears. So the location of the hippocampus makes a lot of sense given that this is hugely important for putting in and getting out 
long-term explicit memories. Oftentimes you'll see neuroscience used to sell a product's effectiveness. For example, we have fear of spiders, a treatment supposed to help with this phobia. So we take our baseline of how afraid of you are a butterfly and then subtract that from your spider reaction and then that gets what this contrast is. So notice, we see here the fear reaction. What would you guess this is? If you said the amygdala, you're correct. But not only that, this is your basic startle. I see a spider, I'm feeling extremely fear, fearful right now for that split second. What also we see is the cognitive part of fear. So this is in our cortex, the outer part, and this would represent the person fixating on that. So for example, thinking, there's a spider here, I'm so nervous, what if that spider comes back? What am I gonna do? That is the higher order component that relates to this primal fear. And then notice the order of operations. First, we have the primal reaction, and then maybe a half a second later, then we start to have the cortical activation. So the initial reaction, and then the higher order thinking about it reaction. Now, I don't know if this is really accurate or not, but according to the sales pitch, basically going through this treatment causes this reaction to reduce greatly. I'm a little dubious because I think what a treatment could do is change people's thoughts so they don't fixate on it. But I think most people, on the other hand, would have a normal and I would say healthy fear reaction in the amygdala to the spider. Uh, so I would be a little skeptical of this claim in terms of how it actually works. Here is a classic example. They're still doing research of this paradigm today. You take a rat and you put it in a room with an electrified grid, so it will get shocked, but it has associated that when it pulls this lever, it gets a direct jolt of electricity to its reward center, which is similar to taking a dose of cocaine or other drug that we highly anticipate. And just like an addict, will undergo severe pain and social losses uh, to get that instant fix, the rat also will undergo severe pain to get that hit of euphoria. Now let's expand out into the most important part of the brain for higher order cognitive thinking, emotions, morality, judgment, decision-making, paying attention, so many things the cortex is responsible for. We are then going to break it down into its four basic lobes and then talk about some specific areas, some cortical areas that are also important as well. First of all, we have the frontal lobe. This is the largest by far. As we can see, there's this big crack known as the central sulcus and anything toward the front of the head of that central sulcus is gonna be the frontal lobe. And clearly it's involved with making plans, making judgments, also I would say paying attention. Um, we'll find out the motor cortex, motor movement has a big part here in the frontal lobe as well. Next up, we have the parietal lobe. This is hugely important for spatial processing uh, abstract math problems, uh, many examples of processing music, creative things. Uh, I will also have parietal lobe activation and connections. It also has, as we'll find out later, the sensory cortex. So when we're feeling sensations, a lot of that is done in part in our parietal lobe. We also have the occipital lobe. It just goes to show that, first of all, if I were to design the brain, if I were God, I would put the frontal, the occipital lobe close to the eyeballs, but instead visual information has to travel a long way to get to where it's processed. But the occipital lobe is also involved with just basically processing one thing, vision, which goes to show that humans are visually dominant and our brain map essentially shows that. We devote a huge amount of space just for processing visual stimuli and then finally, we have then the temporal lobe. 
this is responsible for processing of auditory information. Uh, also has huge links for memory storage as well. And if you just peel this back, you then right underneath it would find the hippocampus and then other parts of the limbic system and the thalamus. Let's look at two additional cortical areas. First of all, we have the motor cortex. So what we see is this big ridge at the back of the frontal lobe that's uh, hugely important for controlling, especially top-down muscle movements. So the motor cortex isn't the only part of muscle movement coordination. You'll see a lot of strong projections or highways set up to quickly and efficiently communicate with the cerebellum as well from the motor area. On the other hand, we have right on the other side of the central sulcus is our sensory cortex. So a lot of our sensory information comes into our brain to our thalamus and then is routed to different areas of the sensory cortex. Here we see an fMRI. If you had to guess, what is this person doing? What is the stimulation? Activity in the occipital lobe, we would suspect this person is watching something. Going back to our sensory and our motor cortex, we see these distorted views of our body parts. Essentially, this is sensory information and controlling motor movement. Not surprisingly, the areas of our bodies that are most sensitive, uh, for example, you can touch someone in their arm and they can't sense it, but touch them on the fingers with that same pressure and they can sense it. So it makes sense that they have more brain real estate devoted toward processing sensory information from our hands than from our elbow. Same thing from our mouth, it's very sensitive as well. Also what this means is that if you stimulate this area, for example, we would find out that that person is feeling some sensation in their finger. Nothing's touching their hand. We're sort of controlling their outside experience uh, through stimulation. Essentially, we're giving them a hallucination. You can also take that logic to the motor cortex as well. If you stimulate this area, for example, they would start moving their lips and mouth uncontrollably. And what's really interesting for me in a historical perspective is that We've known this information for decades, and we didn't do it through neural imaging. Instead, it was sort of a trial by error type of process, sticking electrodes in, stimulating a certain area, and then documenting what does that person say they felt? What does that person start to do? So it seems like a simple picture, but a heck of a lot of research went into understanding this. Now we want to sort of integrate a lot of the things that we've already presented separately. So first of all, something as simple as you drop a piece of food between the couch cushions and you want to pick it up. Well, first of all, you have to make that decision. So chances are your frontal lobe, okay, I'm going to pay attention to this. I wasn't paying attention, that's why I dropped it. Now I am paying attention. You make that decision to reach down and grab it. So your frontal lobe first generates the idea, then that works with your motor cortex somewhere back here, right, that relays the information through the cerebellum and then out so you can control that muscle movement. And of course, if you're not, if you can't see, you have to feel, okay, what's, does this feel like candy or does this feel like some other gross thing that's between my couch cushions? So that sensory information is going through your sensory neurons into your spinal cord through your thalamus and then to your sensory cortex, which will be sort of behind your motor cortex in this image. So as you can see, a lot of different parts of the brain are involved uh, for very simple things to us that we don't have to think too much about. One more aspect to point out of this cross slice is that notice we still have some gray matter on the outside, but assuming this person is an adult, a lot of this matter on the inside is myelinated, and so these pathways going through this area of the cortex should be pretty fast and efficient, given that it's going through white matter myelinated pathways.
Let's look at, from an evolutionary perspective, how humans are different from some of our relative animals. Here we see for rats and cats, almost all of the cortical space is devoted to just controlling movement and processing sensory information, sensing predators, sensing food and prey, and then coordinating muscle movement to react to those things. Now, of course, chimps and humans can do a lot of things that rats and cats can't. Uh, they can make more social judgments. Uh, they have stronger social connections. They may show some signs of morality. They may be able to use tools, so many things. How is that represented in the brain? First of all, it's a lot bigger. There's a lot more cortical space, and a lot of that isn't specifically devoted just to controlling movements and to interpreting sensory information. So going back to the issue of understanding localization of processing in the brain, we want to know what do these other areas do and how localized is processing with those areas. One way to do that is to look at what goes wrong when certain areas of the brain are damaged. A specific example of brain damage involves an aphasia. This is a language impairment. But if we break down language, which is very complicated, two general subcomponents of language would be producing speech, which is represented by Broca's area. It also makes sense that it's close to the motor area. So it helps to produce the motor ability to move our mouth. And then we also have Wernicke's area. Both of these are named after the researcher who basically discovered what they did. It also makes sense here that this is in the temporal lobe because we think we store a lot of our memories here. And so this is the part of the temporal lobe that helps us process uh, meaning in language. So going back to somebody being able to write but not read, someone being able to say a sentence but not understand what it meant, we can then see if there is different damage to Wernicke's and Broca's area. Uh, for those of you in the medical field, also another issue is if someone starts talking very strangely, if they just start babbling and you can't understand what they mean, they might have, for example, a stroke in Wernicke's area. On the other hand, if they're clearly trying to talk to you but can't get the words out, you might then suspect uh, damage to uh, Broca's area. Going back to the understanding of how the brain communicates through language, think about how it's different for hearing someone talk and then we'll see some temporal lobe activation. That makes sense. Versus now we're not hearing, we're just watching someone talk while the TV's on mute. We're gonna be seeing heavily activation in the occipital lobe. And then of course, when we're speaking that language, we see clear uh, motor cortex activation as well as Broca's area. And what's really cool to see is fMRIs in real time of people having a conversation because you see these just different areas of the brain light up and turn off and dance around. And you realize what an amazing ballet it is for our brain to be able to use language as well as it does. Another concept we want to consider is this idea of plasticity. How stretchy or able to recover from damage is the brain? One important thing to consider is that we are born with very plastic brains but unfortunately that plasticity decreases uh, in some ways fairly severely after childhood. Which leads us to the possibility for this example. You can only miss an entire hemisphere of your brain if it happened uh, in young childhood. Of course, if you take out an adult person's hemisphere, they're gonna show some major impairments. Another example of plasticity, this is for a fast forward program showing that a normal child will show very localized activity for reading, whereas the dyslexic will show more diffused or general activity.
the idea here is that with this fast forward programming after the training the person who's dyslexic shows a more normal and more localized activation pattern i'm not sure if i believe it but i like the idea that they're bringing in neuroscience to make their argument continuing our theme with localization of processing of information in the brain we see some differences in what the left and the right hemisphere do and as you can see a hemisphere is just a large area one half of the cortex uh, and notice there's this big line in here meaning that for a lot of the area that the hemispheres physically touch they don't actually have any communication lines open with the left hemisphere we see that it is conveniently given the l theme the left hemisphere is good at language and logic processing very rational whereas the right hemisphere is more impulsive it's more spatial based it's more creative it's more holistic and, and less rational less logical and the idea here is that for for most of us our hemispheres are more similar than they are different so too much has been made of this what we call lateralization one side or the other although there are true differences they have been overstated a bit related to that theme we have no direct evidence that differential hemispheric utilization can be trained so this is uh, a common theme a new neuroscience finding comes out and people take it much too far so for example there were those who said we know there's differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and if you're a left brainer and you need to work on your creativity take our training pay a lot of money and we'll unlock your right brain and make you creative uh, that is clearly a false claim i also note that for plasticity there's been lots of false claims plasticity we do have some as adults uh, but not near as much that i would invest in a technique based on plasticity to improve some aspect of my cognitive function but here's the extreme example of plasticity here is the case study of a seven-year-old girl um, and at age three she had rasmussen syndrome chronic focal encephalitis her brain was overheating um, had epilepsy and had right-sided hemiplegia meaning difficulty controlling the right side of her body so she had her left hemisphere removed because that was determined the only way that they could guarantee that it wouldn't spread to the whole brain what's interesting though is that this procedure happened when she was so young that the other hemisphere could essentially take on the functions of two hemispheres um, and what's really interesting and exciting for me is that she is fully bilingual um, and even her hemiplegia was partially recovered so in fact some aspects were improved uh, of her condition when she had the hemispherectomy it took a while to get there uh, but it happened of course if this happened with an adult that person might not even survive if they did they would have severe severe limitations and it would take years decades for the brain the other hemisphere to absorb some of those functions that the missing hemisphere used to do we can further explore this lateralization or left right differences with the curious example of the split brain patient so we have the corpus callosum as i mentioned before our hemispheres touch but they don't actually interact with each other very much except in this one small space at the base of the cortex so a lot of information is passed back and forth and so our left brain right brain differences balance out because they can communicate with each other so quickly as i described before lateralization is this process of the left and the right doing different things when we for some reason have to sever the corpus callosum almost always this would be the example of severe epilepsy that doesn't respond to less invasive treatments one way 
again in this severe case, is to sever the corpus callosum and slow down some of this overactivity between the hemispheres. Sounds like a very severe procedure, but in many cases we wouldn't actually be able to know if somebody walking down the street was a split brain patient or not. Once we then put them in controlled experimental settings, some interesting differences start to appear. There's the common phrase that the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. In the split brain patient, that is essentially true. The left hemisphere is operating on a completely different set of reality and input than the other hemisphere is. One example would be, you can try this if you want, to have a pencil in your left and right hand and try to draw both of these images simultaneously. Chances are you would have a lot of interference between hemispheres, and it would be difficult to simultaneously do these. A split brain patient, on the other hand, does not have much difficulty. If we want to further explore this illustrative point about a split brain patient and what does that tell us about how our brain works, we need to step back a bit and look at how information gets to our brain. So we're looking at something, we have what's in our left visual field, but that is actually processed by our right hemisphere. Further extending on that, if we want to control our left hand, it is actually our right hemisphere that controls it, and vice versa, our left hemisphere controls our right hand. Here we see that's the small area where the corpus callosum is. When we split that, interesting things can happen when we show different things to the left and the right visual field. Also notice that what we see is actually inverted, so our brain is actually processing a world that's getting upside down images. Of course, since that's all we've ever known, our brain easily processes this upside down world and we don't feel upside down at all. So consider this paradigm, split brain patient is asked to stare at a spot, is set at a distance where you can clearly control what's in the left and the right visual field. Base appears at the left of the spot, ball appears at the right of the spot. What will the patient say he saw? So let's think about this. Which hemisphere is more adept at producing language? If you said the left, you're correct. What word did the left see? The left hemisphere only has visual information for the right visual field. So this person with a split brain will say he or she saw ball. What's interesting though next is if you ask this person to with your left hand point to what you saw, the left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere. The only information the right hemisphere has is what was in the left visual field. So what did you say you see? Ball. Point to with your left hand what you saw, they'll point to base. And here's another example of the same paradigm. Again, what word did you see? The left hemisphere generates the language and sees art. The right hand on the other hand, or excuse me, point with your left hand. The left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere and the right hemisphere only saw the word he. Let's do some review. This is the idea that there's implicit stereotypes or racism, that someone is not trying to be racist, but they have natural reactions to different ethnic groups. Where could we see this sort of automatic fear response? It would be in the amygdala. And this represents a difficult problem because if we see this, how do we change it? Uh, because it's sort of a, a basic reaction, um, we can't just change people's thinking and have them talk it through. Um, it would take a different technique because the amygdala doesn't really respond to thinking and talking. It responds to basic stimuli.
if you felt a sensation, what was stimulated, it would be the sensory cortex. This might be the case. Person is having trouble with their vision. The eye seems to be fine. Where is the neurologist probably going to look? Most likely the area of the cortex that processes visual info, the occipital lobe. Let's try some fill in the blank. This is essentially the definition of localization. Smaller and small, smaller parts of the brain do more specific and more specific things. This is the idea of lateralization. Some things are more processed on the right hand, some things are more processed in the left. What do we call all the lobes together? We call it the cortex, cerebral cortex. Cerebrum is also okay. They're largely interchangeable for us. Which part of the brain is right behind the forehead and especially lights up when we're trying to focus on a specific task? We'll cover this later, but it's important to introduce it now. This is called the prefrontal cortex. So the frontal cortex is really large. The prefrontal is just the part right behind our forehead. So rearranging what area of the cortex processes what kind of information is the notion of plasticity. And what imaging techniques allow you to see the brain while you're working in real time? You don't have to wait for something to develop. You don't have to wait for the contrast to be analyzed. This would be EEG brain waves and the fMRI. Final true false. If we do see stars, is this due to temporal lobe activation? No, this would most likely be a visual hallucination in the occipital lobe. Concentration requires frontal lobe, and even more specifically, precisely, we could say the prefrontal cortex. Language definitely is processed in the frontal lobe to some extent, but as we saw before, the whole process of speaking, hearing, and producing language takes place all over the cortex. We saw a slide of this. This is very true. And the, the key differences are we have more cortical real estate relative to our limbic system and brainstem, and also less of it devoted specifically to motor and sensory processing. Some people, uh, especially advertisers uh, for pl brain plasticity pills, for example, would like us to believe this is true, but this is definitely false. It sounds like a negative thing, but there are good reasons we'll cover later for why our brain evolves like this. It helps us ultimately to be more efficient processors. The downside is once we lock those pathways in, once they're damaged, it's harder to re recalibrate. It might seem like rest is the best prescription, but although right after the incident rest might be good, uh, the best way is to slowly return to previous activities. So don't just totally stay away from work or totally stay away from cooking or reading or writing for a long time. Just slowly introduce it back in to try and bring back the brain slowly. Let's take a minute to analyze our key study for today. As you can see, this is very wordy, which is sort of a characteristic of neuroscience studies. They are complicated, they are technical, but they are also hugely important and helpful for many things that we really want to know about. In this case, we're looking at ADD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, so more precisely ADHD, relating that into how does the brain mature and at what times. So basically, they're looking at a lot of different cerebral points and trying to figure out in what areas of the cortex do we see a clear difference in the age that which that area becomes mature. It becomes fully myelinated. So first we see the general pattern, which is on average, we see that 
the ADHD group takes longer. It's a later age before they reach this peak cortical thickness. So there's an overall delay across the cortex. It seems to be, for whatever reason, those with ADHD um, myelinate their brains more slowly. But also note that it's just a delay. It's not a permanent difference as they do catch up. Also, let's look at if we separate it by from this overall pattern to specific areas, the prefrontal cortex, which as we mentioned, is hugely important for attention. We can see that those with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder have an exacerbated delay in their cortical peak maturation. So ADHD children myelinate their cortexes later, and that pattern is exacerbated for the key attentional component of our brain, the prefrontal cortex. So I think this goes to show that ADHD is not simply a behavioral disorder. There is a clear neurological component as well. I don't know what it says for adult ADHD, however, because look at how this gap in cortical thickness is closed completely. So if there is adult ADHD, I would be less convinced that it is a clearly neurological uh, component. We can take this a step further and look at different views of the entire cortex and see if there are clear differences between typically developing children and those with ADHD. And what we see are two very interesting patterns. First of all, the ADHD group seems to have a faster cortical thickness or cortical maturation of the sensory and the motor areas. So generally they're behind, but the sensory and motor areas they're ahead, which also can explain that there are differences um, in children with ADHD in motor and sensory processing. Um, and also we see the general pattern that the frontal lobe, on the other hand, seems to show a faster development for the typically developing children. All in all, we've come a long way in learning about the brain. There are lots of implications for our lives, for the lives of those we love, for our families, for our friends, for the people we interact with on the job, for our consumption of news in the media. I would like to know your thoughts on these and more. How can we use this information? How can we apply this information about the brain to help better understand the thoughts and behaviors of those around us?